Hello and good afternoon friends. Welcome to the CEC EduSet Live Lecture. Dear friends, we would like to tell you all that today in this session we would be discussing on role of uh, European Union in international system and for this discussion we have with us in our studios Dr. Rajan Kumar. Dr. Rajan Kumar is Associate Professor in School of International Studies, JNU. So let's welcome our guest Dr. Rajan Kumar and let's try to grab maximum knowledge from him. Hello sir, welcome to the EduSet Lecture. Thank you so much Geetika. Uh, good afternoon friends and uh, today we will be talking about uh, the role of Euro European Union in the international system. So what I will do today is that I will give you a brief background of the European Union and that will be followed by the different kind of functions and the roles that European Union plays in the uh, international system. As you know that uh, European Union is the most important, most significant multilateral uh, organization in the world today. Uh, in terms of economy, in terms of per capita income of the people there, in terms of institutionalization of the of the organization and the kind of structure that it has created, it has emerged as the model for uh, other multilateral organizations in the world. And uh, as you know that this is not a very new organization in that sense. Um, it, it came in 1993 with Maastricht, Maastricht uh, Treaty. Of course, before that there were uh, it traces its origin to uh, other kind of uh, collaborations which was happening in Europe, uh, for instance, coal and uh, steel union, um, and I'm talking of 1950s, it started in 1950s, 1951 is the exact uh, year when it started, and also European Economic Community which started again in 1950s. So European Union traces its origin uh, from uh, the developments uh, which were taking place in the post-World War, post, uh, uh, War period, but finally in the formal shape uh, that we see today, uh, it came in 1993 with the Maastricht uh, Treaty and uh, today uh, European Union has uh, uh, 28 uh, members and uh, out of that uh, 19 uh, countries are also part of uh, the single currency uh, which is known uh, as sometimes referred to as the Eurozone uh, and uh, you know it's, it's basically a political and economic union uh, because uh, the, the basic purpose of uh, uh, of European Union is uh, the integration of the European space and uh, is it, 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 it tries to uh, know and if, if I see in terms of classification uh, it plays uh, two very important uh, roles one is the integrative function uh, it tries to integrate uh, the economy and the and the political structure in a single union but it also plays an, uh, another role which is again very important but also uh, uh, somewhat controversial and that is the transformative role and we will talk about it in, in details. Uh, uh, so in the first part I will be talking about uh, uh, these two integrative and transformative functions and that will be followed by uh, some of the, you know, the challenges and the threats that European Union uh, yeah, is facing at the moment. Uh, European Union as you know that you know it has uh, uh, it, it, as I told you that it is a union, it is a political and economic union of uh, uh, 28 states. Uh, if Britain goes, uh, you know, uh, then, then there will be 27 states. So uh, it, it serves nearly uh, 510 million people, roughly that is the population that is served. And it has common policies on trade, agriculture, fisheries, regional development. And as you know that border has been abolished. Uh, the, now there is uh, in the in the in the area which is part of the European Union, uh, there is no uh, border. People uh, pe and then the, the people or the capital or uh, you know the services uh, can travel from one region to other in that uh, broader European Union without any kind of uh, 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 the hindrances or the borders. So uh, it has opened up the border and in a way it has created a kind of a supranational structure. Um, as you know that uh, the, the, the international system today is characterized by uh, the existence of sovereign states and sovereign, by sovereign states I mean the, you know, the various states in Europe or other states also outside the world uh, which are uh, after the Westphalian system uh, you know, the states were considered, all the states were considered sovereign as a, as a separate uh, legal entity. But what European Union has done is that it has created a new uh, supranational structure 
where the sovereignty is some kind of you know the is shared now the sovereignty is uh, somewhat uh, uh, compromised uh, borders are not as important as it, as it used to be uh, before the coming of the european union because you know there is a free flow of uh, uh, goods services capital and also people so the entire notion of uh, uh, the sovereignty has come uh, has acquired a new definition or a new meaning uh, with the coming of uh, european union so uh, in today's lecture i'll be talking about and the two functions of uh, european union one is the integrative function and the second one is uh, the transformative function uh, in the integrative function uh, i'll be talking about the economic uh, political and institutional integration that uh, european union has contributed uh, in the international system and when it comes to transformative roles of european union so then i'll be talking about the promotion of democracy prom the promotion of human rights uh, good governance Uh, the rule of law etc that it has been promoting through various institutions and through various conditions that it has uh, put on the on the member states so first let's start with the integrative functions of the Europe, european union and uh, the most important is the creation of the uh, single market which is the economic integration of the european union and uh, it has created a single market where you know as i told you that uh, there is a free flow of labor capital uh, goods and services uh, from, uh, without any hindrances uh, without any border obstacles of the borders so that is uh, that is something which has transformed the entire uh, it has given a new energy to the to the european union uh, people are not bound by the limitations of the borders there is no visa required for the people who belong to that Uh, what is known as schengen region they can travel from one part to other they can work in in, uh, in any place in the european uh, union uh, region so those are the kind of you know uh, the the kind of uh, and single market means you know that uh, there's basically that there's no restriction uh, in terms of you know uh, in in terms of uh, uh, the migration of either labor or capital or uh, or investment uh, from one place to other within that Uh, the european union region and uh, it has also led to institutional cooperation uh, internally uh, there are various mechanism through which uh, european union members member states 28 member states uh, are are kind of you know uh, they are cooperating uh, with this uh, european commission or european uh, or european parliament so now they have a very well developed uh, structures uh, within that european within uh, within european union so they cooperate they are cooperating and they are integrating uh, through these uh, institutions and uh, so the institutions are uh, are considered to be very successful uh, and that also gave a new model for uh, integration in the uh, in the in the international system uh, it's a different matter and we'll talk about it that how you know these institutions have also led to a lot of bureaucratization and uh, many of the member states now are complaining about over institutionalization of uh, the european union and the countries many of the countries are not very happy uh, with the uh, with the kind of uh, supranational uh, institution that has uh, institutions which have emerged uh, in the european union and uh, you know some of the people also argue that you know the the, the rise of right wing parties in european union is partly an outcome of uh, of uh, the of uh, the over institutionalization of the european union anyway i'll come to that uh, in a moment but for the time being you know we also need to understand that uh, european union does not uh, see, does not uh, is uh, european union uh, has led to institutionalization for integration within the europe but it has also led to integration with other institutions which are uh, outside the european union for instance you know uh, european union has developed a mechanism to Uh, to uh, cooperate institutionally with uh, with the united nations uh, with the world uh, trade organization with the imf with the world bank uh, with the g8 countries so but they have very developed mechanism of uh, uh, in inter institutional cooperation uh, first was the intra institutional cooperation that which is within the european union but also inter institutional cooperation with the other institutions which are there in the international system so but uh, these are the mechanisms through which uh through which uh, the european union has tried to integrate uh within its uh, within its framework and uh, uh, it has also led to a kind of political integration uh of europe uh and the creation of the the schengen area uh, that has led to you know the broader concept of uh, the transformation of uh, the the identity from the state uh, to a kind of cosmopolitan european identity although that identity is still very weak and we cannot really say that 
a broader general European identity has uh, somehow replaced the, uh, the, the national identity. That's probably not the case because as we see the kind of politics which is being played out by the, by the national parties in different European countries, uh, it doesn't really show that, you know, that a broader European identity has emerged which is uh, which you know which has necessarily overpowered the national uh, identity in fact even despite the european union despite the creation of the european identity the national uh, institutions as institutions are still very strong and uh, the the so the right wing parties are emphasizing the reversal of the of the identity where they focus much more on the national identity rather than the rather than the, the globe and rather than the european identity uh, but coming to the next part which is the transformative uh, function of European Union and this is a very controversial part of, uh, of the European Union uh, agenda because you know this transformative role it, it talks about the you know transforming the politics and creating a new kind of norm uh, for the member states and also for the for the countries which with which uh, you know uh, it European Union is trying to have a closer partnership or closer strategic partnership uh, in the neighborhood and uh, it has created in that uh, when I, what I mean by the transformative agenda of the European Union is that it has created a post Westphalian uh, superstructure uh, the Westphalian structure is known by the recognition of the sovereignty of a nation state but European Union has given a new kind of structure which is known as the uh, superstructure a new superstructure which is the European superstructure and uh, and it has it, it exports the norms uh, various types of norms and regimes to uh, to the member states and also to the countries uh, in the neighborhood and it it seeks to transform the the politics and the uh, and the and the and the model of governance in the neighboring countries and that's the and that's the reason i'm using the term uh, transformative so the function uh, one i discussed earlier was integrative function but also it has transformative function and the third part of transformative function is the and most important part is the promotion of democracy uh, and the promotion of human rights, uh, uh, promotion of uh, uh, law, law and, uh, and the good governance. So these are some of the issues which have given a new uh, kind of you know uh, which has given a new agenda to the European Union, which also uh, kind of differentiates European Union with other multilateral organizations uh, in the, in the world. Uh, of course, the UN probably does the uh, you know it does try to promote some norms by agenda setting or it by also promoting democracy, human rights, uh, rule of law, etc. But many of the other regional organizations are not necessarily uh, they do not necessarily have the transformative agenda. But when it comes to European Union, it has it is clearly you know identified or kind of uh, distinguished with other organizations in, because it has a transformative function. It has a missionary function. Where it it tries to you know it tries to change the politics it tries to promote democracy in 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 other countries, so uh, uh, it also you know it has become controversial uh, partly because in the neighboring regions uh, as in Georgia for instance or in uh, Ukraine or in um, you know uh, the uh, other countries like Turkey and other countries you know uh, it has promoted uh, democracy which was uh, which was resisted by the by the indigenous population, especially in Ukraine and Georgia, it became very controversial because uh, you know Russia felt that you know uh, that European Union was trying to uh, interfere into the domestic politics of the of the neighboring countries, uh, which were earlier in the under the influence of of uh, Russia. But uh, uh, these countries, Georgia and Ukraine, uh, they uh, in, in in both the countries there were color revolutions, although uh, color revolutions. Uh, uh, proved to be disastrous and uh, the kind of uh, regime change which was promoted by uh, United States and also uh, supported by European Union. So uh, those kind of you know policies did not necessarily succeed uh, in the in those countries and the reason was that you know uh, the democracy cannot be imposed from other from outside unless until you have the proper institutional mechanism unless until you have a political culture where people are willing to accept the norms and the values of democracy, democracy cannot be imposed uh, from outside. And that's the reason why the attempts of European Union and also United States uh, to promote or to impose democracy in Ukraine um, has failed. It has led to a kind of civil war situation and you know that uh, right since 2014 how Ukraine is, uh, uh, is under the shadow of civil war 
and people are divided. Crimea was uh, uh, was uh, reincorporated by by by, by Russia and uh, even in the eastern part of Ukraine uh, the civil war is going on. So what I'm trying to say here that these are some of the examples uh, through which you know uh, which uh, which give a clear message to the European Union that while promotion of democracy is not a bad thing in itself but imposition of democracy uh, on the other countries which are not uh, ready for democracy or a kind of uh, the promotion or support for regime change in the countries which are not necessarily ready for democracy, that can be disastrous. And that's what has happened in Ukraine and uh, and, and, and Georgia as well. So, uh, you know, uh, the transformative agenda of the uh, of European Union has elements of, you know, uh, controversy and the conflict that I referred to just now uh, is an example of that. Uh, you know, but it also, uh, that in the transformative, transformative uh, agenda, European also plays a very positive role when it comes to you know uh, uh, the promotion of the policy of sustainable development and the protection of environment you know uh, uh, this has been included in the various treaties uh, within uh, in the european union and european union does promote uh, the environmental protection or the laws on sustainable development uh, in the in the neighboring countries and also in the in, in the country with also in the countries with with which it has developed some kind of strategic partnership and uh, and those norms some have been accepted by many of the countries uh, for instance you know india has also accepted the vehicular norms uh, of european union uh, the vehicular norms second and third etc so uh, the environmental issues are very important and those kind of norms uh, have positive role in in other countries and they have been accepted by many of the countries in Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, etc. Uh, and also in uh, Latin American countries. Now, you know, by briefly, you know, I would like you to, uh, you know, uh, show the slide of the European Union's economic strength and how European Union, uh, you know, how uh, this is a function, the, the strength of European Union is a function of internal and external integration of Europe, European Union with other countries. So uh, and this figure is very important because you know it tells you how closely the European economy is integrated with the other economies in the international system. And as you can see, and how the what is the relative strength of uh, European Union compared to other uh, other economic blocks like you know, other economic uh, powers like United States, China, Russia, India, and Brazil. So if I uh, show the if I tell you in terms of the global share of the GDP. United States uh, is 19.5% uh, 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 the global, global share of the GDP, but I'm talking in terms of purchasing power parity. This is not um, in the terms of constant price, but this is in terms of the purchasing power parity and US share is 19.5%. Uh, GDP per capita is uh, nearly 49,000, uh, you know, uh, this uh, in terms of per capita uh, income of uh, United States. Uh, European Union's uh, uh, this uh, share in the GDP, in the global share of GDP is nearly 19.9 percent, little, little more than United States also, and uh, the per capita income is uh, nearly 31,000, approximately 31,000 uh, uh, dollars, and uh, China has, uh, you know, China's share in the global GDP in terms of purchasing power parity is nearly 14.1 percent. And the per capita income of China in terms of PPP again is nearly $8,000. Uh, $8, uh, Russia is 2.9% of the GDP, uh, global GDP share, uh, Russia's share in the global GDP is uh, roughly 2.9%. And the, the per capita income is 16, nearly $16,000. Uh, uh, India is 5.7% uh, of the global share of the GDP in terms of per capita, uh, the purchasing power parity. And uh, here, the, 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 the per capita income, uh, GDP per capita is nearly uh, roughly $4,000. Brazil is 2.9% and uh, per capita GDP is nearly $11,000. Uh, and South Africa, 0.7% uh, and per capita income is uh, nearly $11,000. Uh, now, uh, the, this, is, uh, this uh, tells you the integration of, economic integration of uh, Europe, European Union with other countries uh, in the world. With uh, the, the, this is the figure of exports and imports of European Union with other countries. Uh, with the US, it, it has exports of nearly 59.7 billion euros, and European import is nearly 40.9 billion euros. Uh, 
the, that's the import that that's the amount you know that EU imports from the United States. With China, it has 29.3 uh, export. It exports um, that amount of uh, goods and products, and import is nearly 60.1. With Switzerland, it has 23.5, and import is 18.1. With Russia, which is an important partner, is 12.3, and imports. Uh, you know, it's 26.4, and the, and the ma maximum import from Russia is uh, energy and gas. Energy, which means oil and gas. With Turkey, is 12.2 and 11.2. Uh, uh, With India, is 6.3 uh, billion euros. Uh, that's the export that uh, that European Union exports to India, and the import is uh, 7.3 uh, billion euros. That's the you know amount of imports that uh, goes to uh, European Union from India. So and now uh, coming, uh, so uh, that that shows you how uh, European Union is a play, is a very important economic player uh, in the international system and how closely uh, European Union is integrated with the other economic uh, powers in the world, uh, with the U.S., China, Russia, India, etc. Yes, European Union is very closely uh, integrated, and um, uh, the second role. Uh, which, so that was the integrative function of the European Union. But when it comes to transformative role of the European Union, so the idea of a post-Westphalian system of shared sovereignty and larger super, super, uh, supranational structure that emerged with the European Union, uh, with the Maastricht Treaty, when you know, uh, and later when the uh, when they decided to have uh, common uh, currency, free trade, uh, free trans, uh, free transit, transit of uh, capital, labor, etc., borderless uh, uh, borderless economy and uh, free movement of people. And so that, and also when they created a parliament, which kind of you know, which emerged as a European Parliament, which is uh, uh, where the the decisions taken by European that Parliament became binding on the uh, nation states. So, uh, so um, that's the reason I'm saying that you know, kind of supranational structure uh, emerged in the form of European Union. And uh, the but the most important is the promotion of democracy and human rights uh, in the section on transformative transformative agenda of the European Union. Uh, of course, uh, environmental regimes and also support to poor countries. So they also contribute. They also lead. To, they also you know uh, they are part of uh, the transformative agenda of the European Union. Uh, this uh, the democracy promotion started with the Copenhagen uh, criteria of 1993. Uh, where you know at the European Union decided on the political and economic norms of uh, of becoming a member, and the essential condition for joining the European Union uh, were laid out uh, in that Copenhagen uh, meeting, that treaty, where democracy, human rights, uh, rule of law, and market the economy became uh, the became the basic criteria for uh, becoming a member. Uh, uh, of the European Union and any country which wanted to become the member, of course, it has to be part of the European uh, of uh, the broader continent of Europe. But also, they have to; those countries have to be democracy. They have to they have to maintain the basic extent of human rights. They have to respect the the they have to protect the minorities and the rights of minorities. And, uh, and those countries have to market economy. So those were the conditions uh, which were laid out for becoming a member, and that played a, a kind of you know important role because many of the countries wanted were very tempted by the the larger market, and uh, 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 they were also tempted by the access to the broader uh, broader uh, single market or the single union. Uh, many of the countries from the European Union they wanted to join because you know they thought that uh, that uh, the people from those countries will get better economic employment opportunities, and uh, the Western develop Western European countries also felt that you know uh, they will get access to market in the in the Eastern European countries and also a very cheap supply of labor from the Eastern European countries. So it uh, it was a kind of you know trade off, and both the Western European developed states and and somewhat you know uh, poorer states of european union of of the eastern european countries they uh, they were uh, very they were tempted by the single market or creation of a single economic space so uh, so they these countries many of the eastern european countries which are not necessarily democratic they they started becoming democracy uh, with the with the with the with the hope of joining european uh, union uh, uh, later so that led to kind of promotion of democracy in the eastern eastern european and southern european countries uh, the European Union also promotes, and it has a policy to promote democracy and civil society in the third country, especially in the neighboring countries. It has played a very important role in promoting civil societies which work on the broader issues of democracy, human rights, etc. 
and political reforms through membership conditionality and it also promotes uh, governance which is uh, much more which is democratic in nature so and in the european neighborhood uh, policy uh, for eastern europe and southern european countries it has uh, it has uh, uh, an element of promotion of democracy in these states and you know european neighborhood policy it has four important elements one is good governance democracy rule of law and human rights second is economic development for stabilization third is security and fourth is uh, migration and uh, mobility so european ne- neighborhood instrument uh, it all it also has uh, something which is called european neighborhood instrument with a grant of you know uh, nearly 15 billion euros and the countries which are with which uh, which fall into this category of european neighborhood policy countries are algeria armenia azerbaijan belarus uh, egypt georgia israel jordan lebanon libya moldova morocco syria palestine tunisia and ukraine so uh, these are the countries where uh, european union is uh, promoting this uh, uh, this uh, european neighborhood policy and uh, in european union also gives a lot of aid to uh, to the other countries for instance you know Uh, yeah, this is the figure that you know how much of aid is given by uh, different uh, powerful blocks or powerful economies european union is at the top it that of the total aid in the uh, in the international system the 55 uh, 55.8 percent nearly comes from european union 23 percent uh, from united states 7 percent from japan nearly 3.3 from norway the same amount from canada and other countries contribute nearly 7.2 percent of the total aid which are being given to, uh, to other countries so european union aid goes to afghanistan india syria iraq and africa so in that sense you know european union plays a very important role in the international system but there are certain challenges uh, to uh, uh, there are certain threats to integrative and transformative agenda of of european union and the first and the most important was the brexit as you know that you no know, the britain decided last year in 2016 britain decided to um, to exit from the european union uh, and you know uh, this uh, this is going to happen the treaty is on and uh, britain is going to um, uh, to 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 exit from the union and um, uh, european countries were also facing economic crisis so that led to kind of you know uh, the kind of uh, that uh, eroded the legitimacy of uh, of uh, european union and people feared that kind of uh, economic powerhouse that economy that european union was so that uh, is no longer the case and uh, what ha- what is happening in now is that many of the countries in europe so there is a growing protectionism because of the right wing nationalist policies uh, which are emerging in many of the countries uh, you know uh, this uh, in the in, in france in austria in uh, also in germany and many of the countries the right wing parties are becoming very very important although finally in the election of uh, france the the centrist party one came to power and that's a very positive sign and now it's also being predicted that in germany also a centrist party or a party which supports the uh, the the policies of european union or the existence of european union that is likely to come to power in the election which is going to happen uh, towards the end of this year uh, so uh, there are hopes of european union but the emergence of right wing parties and the euro skeptic party which as it is called so that is a real threat because you know they demand uh, they they are against the, the european union or the broader integration of the european union uh, policies and also there are external challenges to european union uh, and part of it is also coming from uh, the the leader like trump and trump has clearly said because you know he is a very hardcore uh, nationalist and uh, nationalist uh, leader and he has clearly said that he is going to renegotiate uh you know at terms with european union so and and uh, the if there is some kind of protectionism which is promoted by united states so that will also impact the politics and economy of the european union so that kind of policy is a threat to the broader integrative agenda of uh, of the european union so, and this also promote some same kind of you know nationalist and protectionist policies in the european union and the issue of terrorism and uh, the uh, the problems which are uh, with russia in ukraine etc so there are also major challenges of uh, uh, european union in the international system uh, so multilateral in, in, in to conclude the multilateral agenda of european union is facing the crisis at the at the moment but you know uh, we cannot even now you know we cannot uh, completely rule out and uh, the importance of european union in the international system so with this i conclude my uh, this part of the lecture uh, thank you so much
Hi, good afternoon friends and uh, in this part of the lecture I will be talking about uh, the, the how European Union is viewed from outside. So, uh, 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 European Union is, is a very important uh, multilateral organization. It was, it was a model uh, you know, um, uh, for other countries which wanted to form uh, this, uh, uh, which wanted to create a new multilateral organization. Uh, ASEAN, for instance, other multilateral organizations like ASEAN or uh, SARC or uh, the organization in Latin America, Africa, etc., they were trying to model upon the European Union because European Union was considered uh, to be a very successful organization in terms of political integration, in terms of institutional integration, and also in terms of you know the norms and uh, uh, norms that it created uh, in the process of process of integration, and it created a lot of hopes for the transformation of you know uh, politics from a uh, nation state oriented politics uh, to a supra national structure politics or to a, to a politics which is much more you know uh, much more uh, which is uh, which is much which which is based on the concept of shared sovereignty and the and the shared borders so you know uh, what is happening at the moment is that uh, there is a gradual shift in the image of eu uh, from a powerful block an ideal model of integration to an example of house in this area. and why i am saying that you know it appears you know as if the there is a the, the european union is a house in this area, because you know uh, the european union is facing a lot of problems uh, in terms of you know politics in terms of economy in, in terms of you know uh, in terms of uh, the the refugee crisis etc so that has led to the you know that has contributed uh, to erosion of the legitimacy of the European Union in in some senses, and people and the critics have started uh, questioning the role of European Union uh, in the in, in the international system. Uh, uh, this was, uh, they argue that you know uh, that and this was an ideal model of multilateralism in the 1990s and also in the first decade of this century, but with Brexit and the rise of right wing forces, uh, the image has really gone uh, down. Uh, Brexit uh, was the biggest example because you know Britain was the most important country uh, of Europe uh, was the mo probably the, you know, the most important country uh, 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 country in the European Union, uh, but uh, Britain decided to exit from the uh, from the Union. So that led to kind of you know uh, that led to questioning of the uh, the broader integration policy of the European Union, and many uh, and the demands for. Uh, and the exit also started emerging in other countries. Uh, for instance, you know, uh, people started uh, talking of uh, Oxit, which means you know the Aust Austria, uh, which is again an important country in in, in European Union. So the Nationalist Party there, the Freedom Party. So they started talking of uh, uh, and this. Uh, they started talking against the uh, policies of European Union, and they they they, they thought that. Uh, they are, that Austria is not benefiting from the integrative policy of uh, the Union, and it should uh, probably exit like Britain <coughs> uh, from the uh, from uh, from the European Union. Also, Britain, uh, Britain, uh, also in um, uh, France. Uh, although in, finally the the centrist party uh, came to power, so that's a good sign. But uh, but the nationalist party, which was led by Marine Le Pen, uh, so she kind of promoted anti-European Union. Uh, 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 rhetoric in in the election and uh, people feared. Uh, she has a good support in France. Uh, she finally didn't win the election, but there is a fear that you know if she comes to power, then European un Union would be in real crisis. But uh, but it's a good thing that you know she finally didn't come to power. And the centrist power under the Emmanuel Macron, uh, he has uh, become the president of France. So that you know that gives a, gives a positive hope for the for the survival of the European Union. Uh, also, because you know, uh, this uh, uh, in many countries, uh, European Union is also uh, uh, because of its transformative agenda, because of its uh, promotion of democracy, human rights, etc. Uh, European Union is not necessarily taken as a very uh, positive, uh, positive uh, uh, development in the neighborhood. Uh, for instance, uh, in Russia, uh, European Union has uh, a, a negative image. Although you know uh, Russia is very fond of Europe as a continent, and Russia itself considers uh, a part of the European European uh, European civilization, but the European policy of promoting democracy, human rights in the neighboring countries, especially in the in the in the CS countries uh, uh, like you know uh, uh, in the Ukraine 
and earlier you know the European Union's uh, support to Georgia in uh, for regime change and also uh, democratization of uh, Georgia. So though uh, that was not uh, supported by Russia. So European is not necessarily seen as positive uh, in terms of in, in in many of the countries. So uh, also because you know European Union, the economic policy of European Union appears innocuous, harmless. But European, most of the uh, European Union countries are also part of NATO, and NATO plays uh, a kind of you know a very uh, divisive role in the international system. NATO is not supported by uh, by countries like Russia, by by China, and also most of the Islamic states are not in favor of NATO. So not NATO's policies also have given uh, have given a kind of negative image to uh, European Union, and European Union's. Uh, policy to integrate countries like Ukraine and Georgia that led to a crisis uh, in the region, crisis in the Eurasian region and it led to conflict in Ukraine and also in Georgia. In Ukraine is, as, you, as you know, that is still facing the, the civil war because of uh, European uh, Union's policy of Eastern Partnership Program where it wanted to integrate uh, uh, Ukraine uh, within the broader framework of European Union. So. Uh, and there is also a kind of you know mismatch uh, between the uh, between the the real power economic power of European Union Union or the self image of uh, European Union and the actual presence on the ground. Uh, in contrast, you know, uh, if you see the United States, United States is uh, its presence is much more visible in all the countries in the world. Compare that with European Union, which is economically as powerful as the as the United States, but you know uh, its presence in the ground is uh, not very visible. Although I don't say that you know economically it's not present; it is present economically, but it's not visible in terms of you know uh, in in terms of uh, it's in, in terms of the kind of image that it has uh, among the people in other countries. Uh, its its presence is not as much as of other countries like United States and also. Uh, to an extent, China now. Uh, people have started questioning the the the, the generalizability of uh, the norms of European Union. Uh, that has come under criticism. The concept of you know uh, because European Union promotes a democracy, and that democracy is a kind of certain kind of democracy which is based on the models of liberalism. So that kind of model uh, may not be appropriate for all the countries in the world. So many of the countries have turned very critical of. Uh, the policy of the promotion of democracy in the other countries. China is very critical of uh, that policy of European Union. Uh, Russia is also very critical of uh, that policy of European Union. Uh, India's pos position is uh, is uh, is ambivalent. Uh, India, in in the case of Ukraine, for instance, India did not support the European Union. Rather, India said that uh, that uh, uh, Russia has an in Russia has. Uh, uh, Russia has its own uh, geopolitical and national interest in Ukraine, and uh, and uh, it's not it's not proper policy for the European Union to uh, promote democracy or promote the policy of regime change in uh, any other country. Uh, European Union, so that kind of policy or that kind of norm of European Union has come under severe criticism in other countries of the world. Uh, BRICS, uh, for instance, BRICS is an organization where uh, uh, Russia, China, India. Uh, apart from Brazil and South Africa, they are the members, and BRICS uh, also, you know, uh, seeks to transform the Western-dominated and overrepresented uh, European Union multilateralism to one where BRICS has greater say. And these countries, um, uh, countries, the emerging countries like you know China, Russia, and India, they have started playing a much more active role in the economic forums and also in other uh, forums like climate change and. Uh, the other negotiations in the United States, United Nations. So these emerging countries have become uh, very vocal in the international forums. So they do not necessarily subscribe to the to the norms and the values of the European Union. So we see that you know there is some kind of conflict of uh, interest uh, in the values of European Union and the values which are emerging from the developing countries. Uh, in the negotiation in the Doha round of negotiations, uh, you know the European Union could not play much of a role. Because of the because of the you know the kind of uh, significance that these emerging countries assumed uh, in the international economic uh, spheres, so you know uh, those the new changes are happening and those changes are uh, somewhat you know uh, not compatible with the with the values uh, values and the norms of 
European Union. Now the the issue is how is uh, you know European Union uh, viewed uh, from outside. So European Union is considered as a very important trading block, but far less relevant in terms of you know uh, security and uh, uh, political interest. Uh, Europe is seen as a declining force due to economic crisis, uh, political divisions, aging population, uh, rise of the and the rise of the rest. What I mean by here is that rise of countries like China, India, and also you know many of the countries in South East Asia. So that is also Brazil earlier. So that is leading to you know that is giving an impression that European Union is a kind of declining force. Uh, also because you know European Union most of the times uh, you know. Uh, goes with the united states when it comes to political and security policies so you know the interest gets subordinated to the interest of united states as a consequence us remains the main player and somewhere you know the the european union's uh, role is overshadowed europe is still seen uh, in india for instance europe is still seen through the prism of uh, london and new york because you know the english media is very very powerful in india and the news and the kind of you know views which are coming uh, from europe that gets filtered through the bbc cnn and the other other english channels uh, which are popular in india the knowledge about functioning of european union union for instance in india is confined to a very limited set of people like you know the ir experts bureaucrats which which are dealing with the different negotiations and the treaties with the european union and also the business elites uh, who are very active in the european union but when it comes to the image of european union in india uh, the the real presence of european union among the people is not very significant and many of the people probably would not even know that uh, that uh, that the uh, the headquarter of european union is uh, located in brussels europe european union in Uh, many country is taken as uh, one of the poles in the emerging multipolarity uh, within the wto european union's position has come under question uh, the failure of doha round of negotiation was an example uh, from a proactive reformist leader uh, and pro push agent in the 1990s and 2000 it has become more like a defender mediator and the bystander uh, in the international negotiations or in the international forums so what i'm trying to say is that you know european union has become less as a unique and more like as any other player in the international system so it has become one of the poles like the united states the brics like china or india or or russia so it has become like one of the poles in the international system now coming to the issue of european union and india uh, india european union is seen as an important as a very important player as an important actor uh, politics of but politics of european union is rarely covered in indian media brexit was an exception and it has it got wide coverage in the indian media but otherwise uh, you'll rarely find that you know the prime time news channels in india cover the debates about european union politics etc uh, the in the in the economic in the newspapers which are dealing with the economic issues there you do find mention of europe in the issues like the trade negotiations of india with the european union subsidies agriculture subsidies technical cooperation and educational scholarship etc which are being uh, negotiated uh, between india and the european union but otherwise the news coverage of european union is very limited uh, in the indian media and the indian uh, indian uh, uh, newspapers uh, the environmental standards of european union is one issue where Uh, india has adopted the kind of you know the norms and the and the guidelines by european union so that is one thing which is uh, you know discussed when it comes to implementation of the vehicular norms for the uh, for pollution in india uh, india and european union you know uh, india and eu are uh, signed the strategic partnership deal in uh, in 2004 uh, european union is the largest trading partner of india and india is the ninth largest partner of european union uh, in 2004 Uh, 14 trade was 95 billion uh, euro so that's a huge amount of trade uh, that's the you know the highest amount of trade between of india with any other bloc or other any other country and the export was 48 billion and the import was 47 billion uh, european union is also the largest source of investment uh, you know uh, in uh, uh, in india uh, in 2015 the investment stock of nearly 51 billion euros and uh, you know, that came to india from the uh, from european union 
uh, Federica Mogherini, uh, who is High Representative of the European Union uh, for Foreign and Security Affairs and Vice President of the European Commission, was in India in, um, just uh, last month in April 2017. And uh, she was uh, discussing some of the important issues uh, on the uh, how to uh, on important issues like uh, free trade agreement between uh, India and European Union, also security issues uh, in Afghanistan, um, uh, in the, the issue of piracy in the in the in the Indian Ocean, and also the issue of climate change, etc., with the Indian leaders. Uh, European Union remains the biggest market, the largest donor, and the global power. So that image is there in India. And India, for India, European Union is very, very important in terms of economic and political support that India requires uh, for uh, its growth. Uh, the 14th European Union and India Summit uh, is to be held uh, this year. And uh, uh, there, there was an issue of uh, European Union, India, you know, the issue of Italian Marine uh, who were arrested in India. And for some time, you know, the, the, the negotiations were affected because of the marines were arrested uh, in India because you know they, they were responsible for killing of some of the Indian fishermen so they were arrested but European Union you know tried to put some pressure on India so because of that negotiation was stalled for some time but again the the negotiations have started but India and uh, and European Union have not yet signed the free trade agreement and I'll discuss about this in a in a moment. Uh, so, if you see the European Union's relative importance for India, so India US trade is approximately 65 billion dollars. Compare that with uh, Europe, European Union. So, European the India's trade with European Union is approximately is more than actually 100 billion dollars. So that shows how European Union is very important for India. And India's trade with China is approximately 70 billion uh, dollars. Uh, and the India's total trade with all of the country, with all the countries in the world, is approximately 800 billion dollars. So, in that context, we, you can see that how important uh, European Union, Union is for India in terms of economic trade. Uh, EU. Uh, this gives you the figure of European Union India trade in goods. Uh, I'm talking about just goods here, not the services, not the uh, the uh, FDI, etc. So, if you see the imports from India uh, to European Union in 2014, so it was, uh, you know, uh, 37.1 uh, uh, and the export was 35.6. So, uh, this gradually increased, this is gradually increasing from 37.1 to, you know, in 2016, it went up to uh, 39.3 billion euros. And EU imports, uh, uh, you know, it was uh, 12.6 and it imports also went up to 13.7 in 2015 and import which was 11.7 billion euro it also went up to 14.5 billion euros uh, in 2015 so we can see that you know uh, the export and import also in goods and services uh, this is about services and the earlier graph that i showed you was about the goods so uh, the both trade in uh, goods and services uh, trade is increasing and that's a very positive sign for uh, for india and the european union economic partnership so fdi from india you know uh, so this is the figure so which is you know uh, coming which is uh, these are the figures and india's export and uh, if i talk of the products india's exports and imports to european union so exports include clothing pharmaceuticals uh, iron and steel uh, machinery gems and uh, and precious metal metals uh, it, it also includes footwear, vehicle and leather products. Uh, if I talk of in, in the imports, uh, that the products that India imports from European Union, so that includes uh, machinery, electronic equ equipment, vehicles, plastic, chemicals and uh, pharmaceuticals. So these are the items of export and import of India with the European Union. Now the issue of European Union, uh, India-European Union free trade agreement the negotiations were, have been going on for the last 10 years. You know, it is known as European Union India Broad Based Trade and Investment Agreement that started in 2007. Uh, in, but India fears that you know, uh, if uh, the free trade agreement takes place between India and the European Union, so that might hurt the Indian market because European products might be much more competitive than the Indian products, uh, which will impact the Indian manufacturing uh, 
uh, industry. So that's the reason India is cautious and India is not willing to remove or reduce the tariff on number of products, especially the, uh, on the issue of agriculture products. India is India is not you know uh, in, uh, not willing to accept the reduction in tariff because it fears that the European uh, you know European agriculture products will compete with the Indian products and which will harm the interest of <coughs> Indian farmers. And um, Indian agriculture is already facing crisis, uh, uh, you know, because of there are a lot of issues. Product production, product, product, Indian agricultural productivity is low, and then issues of you know uh, the the farmers committing suicide, etc. So, is uh, India is not India is reluctant to reduce tariff in agriculture, and also because you know uh, both United States and Euro European Union they provide subsidies uh, to their uh, farmers, and as a result, you know the kind of production. The, the 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 price of products in europe is cheaper and that kind of subsidy is not necessarily available to indian farmers so that's the reason india is very cautious when it comes to signing the free trade agreement uh, with the european especially on the issue of you know reducing the tariff for the agriculture products and there are also differences on the issues of uh, intellectual property rights uh, the kind of norms that us is, in that you know european union is trying to impose on india so that is not that is not acceptable to uh, to India. So there are differences on the issue of intellectual property rights, patent, uh, on the issue of uh, the generic drugs which are produced in India, and then also on the issue of duty cut on automobiles and the liquor and the liberal visa regime. So these are some of the issues where India and European Union have different uh, approaches and policies, and they are trying to you know renegotiate. Uh, on India, but they are trying to renegotiate on these issues. Uh, most uh, why European India, but you know my conclusion is that in the near future, European Union and India is likely to come closer, and these are the reasons why I argue that India is likely to come uh, closer to European Union. And the most important is the shared value of democracy and the rule of law that you know that India, 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 India has been following for the last 60 years. Uh, if you if you start from the European Union and if you come to India, uh, there is hardly any democracy in between. Uh, so European Union countries are liberal democracies, and from there, if you come to India, uh, you know there is no country in the middle which can be considered liberal democracy. So these democratic norms, which you know, which India has and which India shares with the European Union, so they play a very important role, and it's very likely that in the near future, you know, these two, uh, both India and European Union, are likely to have very good political partnership or because they shared the common values of democracy, uh, human rights, uh, also on issue of uh, uh, this uh, rule of law, governance, etc. Uh, India uh, is also the fastest growing country in the region and that is uh, that is going to play a very important role uh, uh, in you know attracting the investors from European Union and also it will lead to the promotion of trade uh, between the two countries. So that's the reason you see that you know the lot of investment from European Union is coming to India because of the very fast growing economy of nearly eight percent in India. So that is uh, India provides a very important market for the manufacturing products of uh, of uh, the European Union and also uh, India also gets access to the to the European single market. Uh, European Union and India, uh, they have the signed this joint agenda for action uh, 2020, where you know uh, they are going to cooperate on the issue of economy, security, foreign policy, uh, environmental issues, and terrorism, and uh, so that is going to be very important in the near future. But also, what is important is that you know uh, some kind of rift is emerging between India and China, where as you can see that you know India refused to participate in one belt, one belt, and one road. Uh, project of uh, China. So, and also the border issues are border tensions are there already there between India and China. So, as India is drifting away from uh, China, it's very likely that you know uh, India will come closer to United States and also uh, to European Union. So, uh, the European Union, in, in, in nutshell, what I can uh, say by conclu in conclusion is that European Union is an important partner uh, for India. There are certain hiccups, there are certain issues between the two blocks, but in the near future, India and European Union, they, these two blocks have a very bright future in terms of economic and political cooperation. With this, I conclude my lecture here. Uh, thank you so much.
giving us a deep insight into the topic as we uh, are refining more and more prospects of relationship between the European Union and India and you have given uh, one of the uh, I mean uh, most of the major causes uh, why we can think of uh, uh, the better relations between the two countries so uh, can we say that uh, uh, the cross culturalism is also there which uh, will definitely help us out in uh, building the relations well, that's, that's a very important question Geetika uh, because um, uh, you know it also depends what you understand by culture because if I talk of political culture so these two regions share the political culture and I'm talking of the values like democracy values like human rights the liberal values which India has inherited from the United, United Kingdom the Britain which was the colonial ruler in India so in terms of political culture of course yes the shared uh, common political culture but when it comes to the the you know the culture the way we understand in terms of tradition mm -hmm. or the traditional value so there the western values are not necessarily compatible compatible with the indian values and uh, as you know that you know the nationalist parties in india they always uh, complain that india should not be borrowing the culture of the west so india has a distinct civilization india has a distinct culture which is of course secular multicultural country so uh, and that cult that culture is not necessarily compatible with the western culture so there are areas political culture uh, there is a similarity but when it comes to the traditional definition of culture so there are certain areas where the conflicts are also there mm -hmm. so it's a kind of competition and cooperation both in terms of uh, culture um, uh, for india and european union uh, definitely not uh, on the basis of the ethical uh, or uh, I would say that uh, uh, official perspectives uh, we have adopted or we are going to adopt uh, uh, I would say the European Union culture but in some way the or the another uh, we have in a certain way has an impact and we can see also uh, as we are celebrating um, a number of events and causes uh, which in itself uh, is a mark of that. Oh, that's absolutely you know because uh, India is a multicultural country and we have been open to adopting cultural value from other countries. We have never blocked ourselves from accepting ideas and institutions from other countries. We have always uh, you know, accepted the values which are progressive, values which are, which are emancipatory in terms of emancipation of the people. And, uh, and the famous quote from Gandhi that we should be open to all the wind which is coming from the outside as long as it is not sweeping away the you know the food or as, as long as it's not eroding your own culture so we have been open to cultures and I you know the entire the concept of Christianity or the the values or the culture which came from the West so we that have, that have become part of the Indian culture now so that's the reason I say that India is, has, is very multicultural it has taken culture from the West it has taken culture from the the Islamic states so we have emerged as a very multicultural multi secular it's a kind of secular state so we are we, we have been uh, uh, accommodated to the cultural values and the traditions of you know the other societies or the uh, or the the ethnic uh, ethnicities which have come from other 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 countries we also provided them a space and they have become part of the broader indian culture so you know it's a kind of you know assimilation that india has been doing for the last uh, nearly 1500 years and it ha we have done it very successfully yes definitely you have rightly quoted over here that though india uh, has a culture and in that culture there are there are multiple cultures all together and uh, uh, those uh, multi cultures are flexible enough uh, to adopt resist as well as sustain for yes. as long as we want so dear friends we believe that you might have gained a lot through this lecture if you have any kind of feedback to share with us then do write to us at info.cc at the written ic.in this lecture is going to be uploaded on youtube very soon for you so keep writing us keep watching us we would be meeting again soon thank you sir thank you so thank much thank you so much, much. thank you